This is episode 43 of the Just Ask Joey podcast. And she was like, who? And he was like, nah. And we was like, what? And she was like, who? And he was like, nah. And we was like, what? Just ask Joey. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Just Ask Joey. I am your host, Joey. This is the only place on the internet where a former idiot answers your questions to help you either avoid idiocy or get over idiocy. And we're always hoping for the avoiding. So today, it's a very special episode for me. This is my first interview episode, and it is also with a a very close friend of mine, and it is dealing with the subject of addiction. Now, one thing that they tell you in AA, Narcotics Anonymous, all these things, it, that, that addiction is not the, um, the thing that you're addicted to is not the problem, it's the solution. Addiction is, it's a sickness. As much as you want to uh, agree with that or disagree with that, I guarantee you every single person who has actually dealt with an addict in their life understands it is actually an addiction. So this is a this is a more extended episode, but I think it's I think he, Eric did a great job talking about his experiences and talking about things to look for, how it builds up, what it's like going through rehab, what it's like for an addict. I think this is great for people that are, that are are questioning whether or not they have addiction issues, whether they're in the middle of it full on and they've been dealing with rehab, or whether it's a parent or a loved one looking from the outside in. I think he offers a lot of insight. This will be a very helpful episode for a wide range of you. Remember, if people are having issues with specific stuff in their life, drugs, alcohol, gambling, women, food, whatever it is, it's in a, it's, it's a thing that's going on in their head. And he gives you some great tips for how to approach them and then also some great uh, insight into what it feels like to, to be them. So please listen to this carefully, listen to it multiple times. Um, his contact is in the show notes. If you have any questions that you would like to ask him, my contacts are obviously in the show notes. If you have any questions you want to ask me, and please, if you think this, is, this would be helpful for somebody in your life, please share this with them because this whole podcast is about giving people information that can help them in their lives with whatever they're struggling with, and this is a huge episode for that. Again, we're dealing with, with addiction and uh, I'd like to welcome my guest, Eric. Hello, I'm Eric. I'm uh, the singer of Starving Millionaires, uh, Long Beach Records. We've played, I don't even know, a thousand shows, I would say. Warp Tour, The Key Club. We've done many tours throughout the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, Texas. I forgot about that. <laughs> we'll get into that later. We've, we've played extensively throughout uh, the, the left coast. All right, let's get into a little bit about why you're here. Oh, that's, I forgot. I'm a recovering alcoholic. That's the most important part. All right. So the combination of musician and alcoholic is probably not a great one, right? Absolutely. Because you receive praise for being as drunk and as high as possible. You're essentially the leader of the party. So there's this feeling that you have to be the drunkest and the highest of everyone to be the leader. Okay, so what I would like to do is kind of go through and take us through kind of like your phases of your drinking. You know, kind of like the the leading up to the the really bad parts where you're going to rehab and stuff and people are really concerned about your health and then kind of where you are now. And I would like you to go, if you could go from like an inside perspective, what you're thinking, and then an outside perspective, um, kind of conversations you were having from people, you know, that you cared about, family, stuff like that, when they're seeing what you're going through, just so we can kind of cover our bases for everybody, people going through it, and loved ones, if they're concerned about how to reach this person, or if you're in this boat, how are you viewing yourself? Sure. Well, I started out uh, drinking in high school, as most people do, uh, on the weekends and such. Um, And I remember my first beer that I drank, I pounded the entire thing. 
So I didn't have problems drinking right off the bat. There wasn't, oh, this tastes gross or anything like that. It's just I had the ability to open my throat and throw down beer. So I came out of the gate quick. Um, and about how old are you at this point? I, I was probably 16, 50, probably my sophomore year. Definitely my sophomore year. So, And where are you drinking? Just parties, you know, the weekend social parties, stuff like that. I was a big jock, so we would have football practices and games and stuff, and then we'd go party afterwards. So, I mean, is your, I could imagine it's a typical experience for most high school folks, especially jocks, beer drinking jocks, you know. So are you drinking with people your age or older than you? It was most it was older people that were that were doing it. So I was sort of following their lead and trying to keep up with uh, you know, they were obviously better than I was, but I didn't want to it was peer pressure, essentially. I didn't want to uh, be uncool, if you will. So I just kept up with them the best I could. So you just getting wasted or like trying to keep up with them or like how did it develop how did it start well in the beginning it was something that actually i did a bit of acting i would uh pound a couple beers uh i'd have a 12 pack that was a big thing to carry around a 12 pack if you could drink a 12 pack you were the coolest so i'd get about two three in and start to feel sick and then I'd open a few and dump them into the bushes and carry around empty beer cans just to kind of act like I had put gone through more beers than I actually did. So I wasn't really serious about my drinking. It was more about appearance and, you know, being cool, that kind of stuff. I can imagine that people can identify with that, trying to keep up with older folks and, you know, looking cool and all that kind of stuff. So I, I did that. And then as high school progressed, I started enjoying drinking more and it went from beer to starting to drink hard alcohol, taking shots and things like that. So my senior year, I was drinking probably 10 or 12 legitimate beers and some shots. And then we're starting to mix in, you know, some, a few drugs and stuff like that, you know, experimenting with that kind of stuff. But I was a pretty seasoned drinker by the end of high school. I mean, I could hold my own. So is this still on weekends or is it carrying over into the week now? No, it's still weekends because I had to be home and, of course, you have to go to school and, you, you know, you can't be hungover for school and you got your parents looming over you, you know what I mean? So, but if you, you were talking about parents, I can remember coming home on Friday night and then sleeping a lot of Saturday morning, you know, into Saturday afternoon and already having my parents sort of be like, you know, why are you sleeping so much? I, you know, it's, this is out of character for you. So they were already starting to sort of pick up on like what's going on here. And with so many friends doing the exact same thing, it doesn't seem out of the ordinary. It doesn't seem weird. doesn't necessarily seem bad yet. Yeah. Except this is where my, need to be sort of a party leader. Uh, let's keep in mind, I got party animal for the school senior yearbook. So I was pretty well known as an idiot back then. So, uh, all right, I'm going to find that. I'm going to cut it in right here. Do that. It says, and this is, this is true. Um, Eric rules the porcelain gods. That's what it says. That'll be, yeah, that'll be, that'll be my legacy. So in high school, that what I'll what people will think back and remember about me is that I threw up a lot. Yeah, not exactly something you want to share with the kids. Yeah, most like most likely to succeed. No, you know, kind. No, party animal. That sets the tone sort of for where I'm at right now. Right, I mean, 17, 18 years old. So I don't know if people know that we went to high school together, but we came from what I consider to be sort of a hard party culture. I mean, we were pushing the, the limits back then. Uh, I used to call it sport drinking, that you know we would drink as a sport rather than just to get a buzz. I mean, it was to outdo your friends and to see how drunk you could get and then draw on your buddies and all that stuff. So it was early on, the group that I was in was kind of a hard drinking crew. Yeah, and pretty competitive also. I mean, a lot of athletes and stuff, and I think just the tendency to compete with your friends in anything on the field, drinking, all that stuff. And that's, that's basically the mindset that I was in. We were all in and I didn't want to lose. 
Yeah, and, and on top of competing with our friends, you're also competing with yourself, seeing how far you could push it because there was almost like a manliness and a conquering to stay out till like four in the morning, five in the morning, and then get up at eight and go to class, even though you're not paying attention to anything in class. It's like a little victory for you just to even make it. Yeah, so that was the only goal. Just get there. So you're not, just so you don't get a tardy. Okay, so... You're at a place now, you're graduating high school. What did you do after you graduated high school? Because that's when things usually kind of pick up is when you get to college. I knocked around for a year in a junior college where everybody else went away to college. Uh, and I played some junior college football and there was still that party culture. And I had the brilliant idea, not the grades, but the brilliant idea to move out to uh, Santa Barbara uh, Isla Vista specifically, uh, to study. Um, and that's where the partying and the drinking became a lifestyle. Uh, and you no longer have that oversight of your parents to kind of keep you in check. You're almost celebrating the fact that that's not there. So you're, you're doing more and more because you can get away with it. And for people that aren't familiar with Santa Barbara or California and Isla Vista, can you give kind of a description of what the town is like? Uh, yes. It is probably a town that's only about two miles in diameter. Um, but there's got to be, gosh, I couldn't even tell you, thousands of kids that live on top of each other in these little you know, shit beach houses. It's right on the beach. There's, it's a cliff, literally. I mean, every year a kid will fall off the cliff into the ocean, uh, drunk. It is the worst place for someone who's on the verge of becoming an alcoholic to go to school without the intention of going to school. Um, and this has to be like the most densely populated city of just students in the world. I mean, this, like you said, it's two miles in diameter. It's the beach. It's people that want to go to school, people that don't want to go to school. It's insane there. Yeah, the, the, the craziest college experience in a negative way that you could imagine. And you weren't even going to UC Santa Barbara. You were going to the JC, right? Yeah, which is actually not even in the town where I was living. But they, they have the kids there that are there to get their degrees and they do what they do and they, they have parties and go to them healthily. And then there was guys like me who from the, from the get-go when I moved there, I drank every day for probably four months. So <clears throat> I didn't see my parents for four months. And when I left, I was in the best shape of my life because I had been playing football. And when I came home for the first holiday, I forget it was like Thanksgiving or something, I had gained, I think, 40 pounds. Yeah, dude, I remember you coming home and just being freaking huge. I mean, just fat face because... All I did was drink keg beer and eat pizza. I mean, that was it. That's all I did. Yeah, and the kegs were like 30 bucks, and the pizza was $5 and over 24 hours. By the way, if you're in the Santa Barbara area and you want to go to Domino's Pizza, the number is 968-UCSB. I still remember that. I have like encoded it in my brain because I'd be so drunk every day. They knew my name. Um, so that was it. It was warm beer and cold pizza. That's what we did every single day. And, and, and we played video games and obviously didn't go to class. So this is where your body, my body, started to build up uh, a need for it. I started to feel a little bit sick and get anxiety when I didn't drink because it was such a constant, constant thing. Um, and then, of course, then we're not only with the keg beer – you're mixing in the Jack Daniels, which obviously if you watch the videos that, you know, I wrote songs about Jack, love songs about Jack Daniels, and, you know, that kind of stuff. So we, that the hard liquor is where you, I started to run into real trouble. Okay. So at this point, are you having any conversations with your parents yeah. about drinking or are they just assuming that you're just eating like shit um, because you're on your own for the first time? I think that, they were starting to, they knew what was going on, but I don't think they wanted to have the, that conversation. They were starting to look the other way and, um, you know, starting to get into denial. 
And just like high school, because there are so many people around you doing it, it's not that weird for you or them. Yeah, like, it, you know, just he's maybe he's off drinking too much and whatever, and that's what kids do, and he'll get over it. Uh, I've never really talked to him about it, but I remember my mom and I remember uh, specifically you guys and all my friends saying, God, you're fat. You know, <laughs> like you could not believe how heavy I was. Like I'm, I'm usually like a 180 pound guy and I weighed, I think 220, something like that. Yeah. And you um, had your hair I all mean, like grown out and crazy yeah, too. I just didn't, I didn't keep myself up. I didn't care. You know, in high school I cared about, you know, the ladies and all that. And I just dropped those priorities and I just video games, beer and Jack Daniels and pizza. I mean, that, that's all I cared about. And are you doing this alone or how does it, how does it work with a like social dynamic? No, not yet. No, this, I, I had a crew of, of some buddies. What's up y'all if you're out there. Um, but actually one of them got diabetes. So there's some health issues. Yeah, man. I, the one thing I remember is I was looking at what college I was going to go to and going down there, and I was like, man, there's no way in hell I can go to school in this environment. I'll be 45 years old still trying to get my freaking BA. Which is why you have a degree, Joe. That's why you have a degree. But there were people that we would like go down and hang out with, and they would party just as hard as, maybe not just as hard as you, but just as hard as us, and we'd be all hungover and wasted and stuff. But then they were going to class during the week. They were graduating with honors. They were transferring schools. And I remember somebody was going to Dartmouth and like they were able to handle it. I don't I don't get it. Yeah, I dropped that priority long, you know, maybe a couple of weeks into arriving in Santa Barbara. I, I can't do both of these. So I'm just going to choose the drinking. And just to give people kind of a visual of your house and how you were living at this time. I remember you had a keg in the middle of the kitchen with ice all around it that never got cleaned up. So the floor turned black. I remember uh, somebody's head went through the wall and knocked out the electricity to half of the house, but it never got fixed. So you were just kind of living in the dark. It never got fixed. There was a time, there was a good six month period when I lived with no gas. So I would just take cold showers just hop in and, and just deal with it real quick. And then like, there was no priority. It was use every dollar that your parents send you. Cause I didn't have a job uh, and just use it on alcohol as, as quick as we could. And I don't even, now that I think back to it, I didn't have a fake ID or anything like that. I don't even know how I acquired all that. That's the thing about being a drunk or an addict or something is you find a way. However it is, you're going to find a way. I mean, there's people out there with thousand dollar heroin habits who are living on the street, but for some reason they figure out a way stealing or begging yeah, or whatever it is. At the end of the day, they're going to get what they want because that's what we do. So at this point, have you had any conversations from the outside, people seeing what you're doing and recognizing for what it is and trying to kind of let you see the light? I had a, uh, a conversation with Kevin Tillman uh, when I was at home and he said to me, you're drinking too much. Um, and I remember that stuck with me. And he was one of the first people who ever stopped me and, and said, you know, you got, you got an issue. You got to look at what you're doing because it's not working for you. So it obviously had an impact on you. So what are you telling yourself at this time? Like, how do you talk yourself out of there being a problem with your drinking? Oh, just bullshit. Bullshit myself. Um, it was impactful at the time. And about how long did it take you to get past the conversation? Oh, the drive on 101 to Santa Barbara. I mean, good. So like four hours. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is what goes through your head when you're an alcoholic is someone will give you some good advice or you'll get arrested or you'll have some sort of thing. But it, you'll always talk your, your way back to it because – it's so much more powerful than you are. Um, I, you know, mentally where we are in this timeline, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm getting there. And I think part of the problem too is you have a pretty big group of people that are doing the same thing you're doing. And then you have this one guy, no matter how influential he may be, it's, it's just one dude versus, you know, the whole group back in Santa Barbara so much more powerful of influence. You know, you got all these people over here 
and then you got one or two people. So they're just going to, it's just going to dominate, you know, your priorities. I, I had a lot of fear. You know, a lot of people were coming out of high school and they were getting, you, you know, scholarships and letters to go to schools and things like that. And I didn't have any of that. So when you're in high school, you live in this sort of bubble and, and the rest of the, your life doesn't really matter. But your senior year, you have to start thinking about, you know, what am I going to do? You know, the real world starts to step in and say, all right, you know, the playtime's over. And for me, it was like, you know, I mean, it's not over. I don't want it to be over. You know what I mean? Um, so I started to have anxiety about that. And a way to ignore that is to drink and have fun and essentially forget. In Santa Barbara is where I picked up a guitar. And that was something that I was good at. Um, and I had all this free time uh, to teach myself to play the guitar. So that was obviously not a, the, you know, the most solid dream, but that was the only thing that I was motivated to do and that you could do when you're drinking. Um, that kind of went hand in hand with the drinking. So I said, just decided like, oh, I'm going to be a musician, you know? Okay, so you... You kind of tapped in to your your artistic side, and to me, you've always been a pretty artistic dude. So you decide to expand on this, get out of Santa Barbara. There's not much of like an artistic scene. You're partying too much. You probably start feeling you're partying too much. So you end up moving to L.A. Hollywood. Hold on, back up. I went to Sunset Boulevard and Poinsettia, which is in in the the heart of. Uh, I went from the, the the most party place you could be in Santa Barbara to the most party place you could be in arguably the world, if not the United States. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, so you like graduated and now you're a professional partier. That's right. Hollywood is absolutely the next level. This is where it starts to get bad. So at this point, are your parents saying anything? I mean, you're going from like one like really party atmosphere where you're obviously partying too much. You're you know, 220 pounds or whatever, moving down to LA, which is like you're saying, it's kind of like the capital of, I mean, besides Vegas, it's like the capital of debauchery. Well, the signs are there. Any Anybody can see them. And, I, you know, I'm not faulting my parents. They were trying to help me. And I had good intentions. I was going to go there and study film. I'm a connoisseur of films. And I, I actually did read my books and you know, I, I tried that and I worked as an extra uh, in Hollywood on a TV show for a couple of years. So I managed to, to juggle somewhat of a normal life, but I was drinking all the time. So they were totally supportive because it was something that they really believed that you liked and could be successful in, right? Yeah, it was like, go for it. And the thing, the thing is, they were very hesitant for the Hollywood move, um, but... I got my SAG card uh, very quickly, L lucky, just because I look like a policeman or something. So I, I joined this casting agency and I got a job like the next day. And then you have to get free union job. I figured, dude, I'm going to be in movies in a week. So screw it. And I was on television every week. So my parents would see, it's called The Division. It's actually with John Hamm. Who's like you know from Mad Men, big star now, and uh, he has yet to call me back. But um, so my parents had a reason to think that maybe Eric's on the right track. But I know they were definitely worried. Have you always just been an artistic person throughout your whole life? I was drawn to look at me, and uh, in, in whatever form that is, which ultimately goes to my insecurities. I don't want you to look at me, so I'm going to put on this persona. And then you're essentially not looking at me. You're, you're, you know, you're looking at this, this that I've created, you know, liquid courage and all of that cliche stuff. So are you just going nuts in Hollywood at this point? Uh, I'm just out of control. Uh, drugs. So at this yeah. point, are you having any conversations, friends, parents, family, like anybody seeing what you're doing? Um, I had a couple conversations with my dad where he would ask me, you know, what are you doing? You know, the, what are you doing with your life? Is this you know, in person or is it on the phone? How are they communicating? Well, my parents, they came down one time and you know, and everyone else should know that we lived 
I lived with three other guys. We lived like pigs. I mean, um, there were roaches in our apartment and we just didn't care. We just flip them off. I mean, we didn't even go buy bug spray or anything, you know, like it's just, we just lived like pigs. But you still have these two other guys, your roommates that are kind of validating your lifestyle and your partying there. Yeah, but as you, as you can see, the amount of people that are starting to support this behavior is shrinking. So I'm getting less and less partners in this behavior. Would it have stopped if you had nobody? Or do you think you would just keep looking till you found somebody to validate what you were doing? You know, I don't know. Cause that's not how it worked out. I can't answer that. I, I'm sure that I would have found someone else. It's not hard. I mean, we, we used to buy weed from a neighbor, you know, the guy two doors down, the guy with the Coke was in the building next door. We lived right by the, the Safeway or the Ralph's, Ralph's, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, everything was super accessible and acceptable. So do you think that the fact that you'd be doing all this crazy stuff, living in this horrible environment, but then you would go down to Sunset and you'd right. essentially be rubbing elbows and hanging out with like superstars, like millionaires and actresses and actors. Right. That's essentially where starving millionaires came from was that we were living like pigs, essentially starving, you know, eating top ramen, you know, and then we would go to a bar and hang out with, you know, Jack Nicholson or something and just rub elbows with those guys. So it was this amazing contradiction. So that's where the name came from. But that was, like you said, sort of justified my behavior. Yeah, I'm a slobby piece of shit drunk. But hey, I was hanging out with you know, such and such last night, you know, whereas they're getting up and working and I'm sleeping in, wait for the next night to go do the same thing to justify my behavior. So are you starting to see any drop offs, any tensions in friendships and stuff while you're partying this hard? No, but I had friends drop off at home from home. I would go home and visit and there became this sort of don't tell Eric there's a party kind of thing. Like, or, you know, I'd hear that there had been one and I'd always wonder like, how come I didn't get to go? You know what I mean? So I think that there sort of, there started to be this chatter that if you have a party, you know, it used to be Eric, you got to have Eric cause he rules the porcelain gods and, and to, if you have Eric over, he's going to throw up in your pool. You know what I mean? Like, so it's it's changed. So did you reflect on your behavior, or did you just think they were all pussies? This is like, this is like the pussies. Fuck those guys. You know, I don't I don't care about them. You know, because there's that saying that everyone who's really cool in high school becomes kind of a loser, and I was starting to realize that you know I was cool, but hey, these guys are starting to graduate college and you know such and such is going to be a doctor and i haven't done a damn thing you know what i mean and nothing nothing makes you feel better than getting drunk so you can forget about that stuff and now so after all this now the band starts we had something pretty tragic happen in our community and we all went back to san jose and i had been living in this apartment essentially alone for about a year drinking every day, going to a bar called The Powerhouse. They knew my name, Cheers, all of that. Uh, and I had compiled this list of like maybe 30, 40 songs because that's all I did in between doing this extra work. Uh, so I went back, saw all my friends. We had this big, basically this big drinking party for a month. I mean, it wasn't a party, but it was a gathering. Uh, and I met up with you and I met up with uh, Dave and showed you guys our song, my songs. And then we decided to essentially start playing. And that, I mean, that was like the next, cause my, my life was about to fall down. And then this thing happened and it was like, Oh, okay, cool. I can get on this roller coaster ride. And then I won't feel like such a loser. Cause now I've got this going for me. So what was going on that made you feel like you were about to like drop off and you were a loser at, at that point? Well, I felt it because the, the, the 
show that I was on got canceled. The consistent show that I was on got canceled. So anyone who's acting knows that you're out of work a lot more than when you were actually working. So it was, you know, I've got some consistent employment to now I've got nothing. And, and then this thing happened and then boom, now I've got this new thing, which is everything I care about and everything I've been working for, you know, writing all these songs and envisioning all this stuff. I mean, I used to just get drunk and play into this drum machine and pretend that I was playing to a crowd. So when I got to you guys, I was ready. You know, I had done it over in my head many, many times. So when I met you guys, I was like, boom, this is it. This is the one. This is, we're going to do this. Look at me in a different way. So this is great in one aspect and absolutely terrible in another aspect. Yeah, this is when it becomes debauchery. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, as you know, our philosophy was we would just play for anything, you know, anytime, two, not two gigs a night, anywhere, high schools, backyard, whatever, you know, we would play for anything. And I, in hindsight, made the mistake, and you're guilty of this, uh, is we wrote that song about drinking double shots of whiskey, double brown. Uh, so you're setting this precedent. All right, every time I play this song, it's my job to drink a double shot of whiskey. I mean, hey, I, this is my tune. I'm not going to back down. It's a good song, and I love it, and I'm glad we wrote it, but that was uh, that set the standard for this is what kind of band we're going to be, this sort of hard party and punky, in-your-face, fuck-you band, which I, I, don't, I, don't, I think you guys had more of the this is a business and, you know, essentially we need to make money <laughs> because I can remember going to, to shows and, and, and leaving with no money in my wallet when I should have left being paid. But it was more important to me to, to drink and be a rock star. For me, it wasn't about, you know, trying to gain success and gain fans and things like that. I didn't care. I was about getting laid and getting drunk. And that's all I care about. Um, and my, my ego was enormous. And that's the thing about uh, addicts is it's all about ego and selfishness. And that's where I was at. I was the biggest rock star in the world in my mind. And just to kind of paint a picture for people that are listening and watching, we jumped off pretty fast. Like we had – within a few months, we had like the number one song on – local radio we were playing sold out shows we were playing bigger and bigger shows in cities further and further away we were you know signed by long beach records we were hanging out with with people in la and down south and it's things were like really good really fast and then kind of the partying in hindsight caught up to us and things sort of leveled out which then makes things worse I started to get depressed. So, like I said, I had come to you guys with 30 something songs and the time came around to write another album and it just wasn't there for me because the drinking was so much more important and it had started to affect my health um, in a way that I was starting to get the sweats when I woke up in the morning, I was starting to shake uh, and starting to need a drink and starting to sneak alcohol. That's one of the first signs <clears throat> of the fact that you're an alcoholic, other than it affecting you negatively, is you start to sneak it. So, And we're not talking beer anymore, right? We're talking just straight hard alcohol. Yeah, well, uh, the beer I would have just for like a stage prop, but I was – drinking vodka before, drinking it during, drinking it after, drinking it on the way home. I mean, you guys can, you know, I never drove. Um, there's that one story. We were in Tahoe and we were with uh, the Third Alley guys, uh, Long Beach Records, great band. Um, and uh, The original Third Alley. Yeah, the original version. You guys, you guys were... Uh, you guys were full of me that night because I was just so wasted. And you said, screw it. You're driving. We're not driving you. And I got in the car, 
put it in reverse and ran right into a wall. And you're like, get out of the car. And I still have the dent in the truck to this day. Now I've lost all responsibility in the band. I don't even have to pack my shit up. Uh, I don't have to drive, you know, you know, I remember that one time you guys just lost me in Arizona. Uh, you know, I, I can imagine there's times that I just got, we left you. I mean, just, uh, we can't deal with Eric. So, so I want to get to the health thing it's starting to affect my. So set up kind of where you are in life at this point. We know you're in the band, but what else is going on? Well, I was married, um, completely wasted at my wedding. Don't remember it. Um, and doing these tours, living this lifestyle and trying to play husband and all that stuff and not liking each other and all that kind of shit. And that fell apart as it should. Um, uh, and then I was alone. So there's nothing better for an alcoholic than an excuse to drink. So this was the perfect portrait for me. I, she left me. I have no furniture. I, you know, poor me. Like I would write stuff and record stuff and wake up in the morning and be like, what is this? God, this is terrible. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure from you guys to write the, some music and, or at least be present when we were writing music. And I just wasn't there. So I just essentially lost my only real companion, my wife at the time. You guys were very distant from me for obvious reasons. And I just locked myself in my house and started drinking constantly, not eating, uh, rarely eating, all, you know, because when you're an alcoholic, you can't really eat because you'll throw up. So this is when I became physically dependent on alcohol. I could not go a day or be around anyone if I hadn't drank uh, because my body would not allow it. You know, my body would be like, hey, what's going on? Where's that? Where's that poison? You know what I mean? So have your parents kind of reached a max for concern about you? Yeah, my parents were deeply worried. Um, they would come and visit and have talks with me. And this is when you need to go to rehab. Talks started to come up and may maybe you should get some help. And I got a DUI. Um, so I was forced to go to AA for a little bit. That's when I first got kind of the, a glimpse into the AA community. And I had, and you would think that that would scare you straight. You know, you get, you have to go to the drunk tank and all that. And it's like, nah. So then with all these things going on, the marriage, your parents talking to you, the band stuff, the friends, are you like, is it a problem yet? Do you see in it clearly now? Oh, of course. I, I would tell people I'm an alcoholic. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I would call the bartender's nurse because they were essentially feeding me my medicine. Um, so, yeah, I, I was well aware of the fact that I was an alcoholic and I wore it as a badge of pride. I, I liked it, but I didn't. You know what I mean? It's kind of a catch 22, but this is where you have to create friends. Now you don't have that crew anymore. So you go to a bar and you just talk to people and you find that guy who you can get drunk with. You know what I mean? So what are you telling yourself at this point? Like how, how are you seeing all this stuff around you and not either taking action or like, how's it affecting you? Like, how are you, how are you getting past all this? Alcoholism is a disease and it affects your brain. Um, and it's str uh, cunning, baffling, and powerful. And there's always a, always an excuse to not listen to people. I'm a smart guy. I understood what they were saying. but And sometimes being smart is actually makes it worse because you're outthinking the solutions. Right. You know, alcoholics are smart. Addicts are smart. I mean, mo most alcoholic addicts that you meet are some of the most dynamic people you'll ever meet because they're creative and, you know, outgoing. Yeah, because they all have ADHD. Right. Uh, and they're all self-medicating. Were there any people that were having conversations with you that you couldn't hear them because you would look at their lives and some of their situations and it would kind of give you that feeling of, well, 
who the hell are you? You're doing the same shit I'm doing. Well, that's an incredible justifying point. It's just, you know, well, fuck you. You drink too, you know. That's not fair. But she was getting up and going to work. And I was sleeping, sleeping until noon and drinking in the morning and whatever. I mean, I used to get up, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Kingpin, but, you know, there'd be a bottle sitting by my bed. I would get up and swig out of that and then go back to sleep for a while and then get up and swig out of that, throw up, swig out of that, throw up, swig out of that. Then I was okay. It, I had to. I had to. Um, you know, it's, it's not an excuse, but at that point, my body would not function without drinking alcohol. So how is it affecting you physically? It's encompassed my entire body. I was afraid to shower because I would fall. One of the, the main ways that alcoholics die is injuries. It's not, you know, you look at heroin, it's like overdoses, cocaine, overdoses, things like that. Alcoholics slip and fall on the ice and crack their head open. They bleed to death or they drive a car into people or fall off cliffs or whatever it is. So I was very aware that, shit, I'm in danger at all times. I mean, God, I have so many scars on my body. I don't know if you can see this scar on the top of my head. Um, but, you know, I just you know, dang, dang, wake up and you're like, How, where is this from? You know what I mean? So all this stuff that's going on at this point, what's, what's the bottom for you? Yeah, so I had to go to a doctor for some reason. Um, I, I got in a car accident. I had to go to a – I was sober. You were there, actually. Um, it was a crazy day because I was going to the liquor store, and I forgot my wallet. And I was driving home, and someone hit me. So, I mean, I, I'm not religious, but, you know, by the grace of God, whatever, I mean – that I wasn't drunk because that would have been my second DUI. I would have been jail time and whatever. And I went to there uh, to the doctor, the emergency room, to get sewed up. My head got fucked up, and the doctors looked at me. I was shaking, and and you know I had obvious um, withdrawal symptoms. And he told me if if you don't stop drinking, the, the, you know the way you look, what I see from you, you're you're gonna die. Um, but you can't stop immediately because of what I'm looking at you you'll die uh, so i just brushed him off fuck you you're a doctor you don't know anything but you sleep at a holiday in last night so uh a couple weeks later i went out to la uh with some chick and i had a, a bunch of vicodin or something i was eating all those and drinking like crazy and i had a seizure an alcoholic seizure bit through my tongue <clears throat> and that left this stain of blood on my parents' floor, and uh, paramedics came and that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't tell anyone except the neighbors told my parents when they came home that there had been an ambulance uh, at their house. And then my parents asked me what happened, and I said, you know, I had a seizure. And then they went into sort of, all right, this is a big fucking problem rescue mode we've got to do something um so i can you would think that, that would make me stop uh it didn't so doctor's warning screw him seizure screw him uh and i just went home and drank more and more and more because it, you get you get helpless well and at that point too yeah. uh, if you drink you're gonna die if you don't drink you're gonna die so it's like well, what the hell so i thought I thought, well, you know, look at it. you know, I'm gonna die anyway. Uh, so my parents got together with an interventionalist because this, at this point, I was basically a recluse. I didn't really leave my house. The one time I did would be to go get alcohol, and this time I would do it in bulk because I knew that I'd be out like three, four days. So I just I'd close my blinds and just sit in this place and, and drink all the time, and I had no sleep schedule. So it'd just be like, drink till you pass out, drink till you pass out, drink till you pass out. Doesn't matter what time, could be daylight, could be nighttime. I didn't, I didn't know what time it was. Um, you know, I, I had a, a little bit a sense of time by what was on TV, uh, but that was about it. Um, so my parents, the day after I was screwing around with some neighbor chick, 
and I uh, passed out and was sort of unresponsive. And I think that she had called my parents, got a hold of my phone. This is before you could like lock your phone. And I think she called my dad. This is the day after my birthday. My dad came down to LA and knocked on the door. And I remember looking out the window like, who's here? You know, like all freaked out and just wasted. I, don't, I just was in my underwear. And my dad, I think he started crying. It's one of the only times I've seen my dad cry, actually. Uh, and he just said, you're a fucking mess. You need you need help. You're, you're coming home with me. So we packed up what little stuff I had. Um, and we drove out to L.A. And I drank that whole night. And I woke up in the morning and drank in the morning and there was a this man in their living room. <clears throat> uh, he's a real big guy, real nice guy. And he was laying on the ground, kind of petting the dog. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm, his name was Dirk. Uh, I still chat with him every now and again, great guy. Um, he said, uh, you know, can I talk to you? And uh, we went out and he said, you know, I think, I think you might have a problem and I was wasted. So I was like, yeah, totally. And I got a problem. Um, and he said, I know you're a musician. I've heard some of your music and you know, you, I think you're talented and, and this and that, and you know, you don't want to waste that. Um, and I'd like to take you to this place called the studio. And I said, Oh, the studio. Sure. So it turns out this place is called Cirque Lodge. It's in Sundance, Utah, which is right over that way. Um, uh, it's a great rehab, one of the best in the country. If you want to look it up, it's CircleLodge.com. Um, and he said, do you think you want to get some help? And there's a part of me that wants to believe that I just said yes, cause I was drunk and I wanted some attention, but there's some part of me that really did want to stop. And I didn't want to be a slave to having to do this anymore because being an alcoholic is tiring. So I, I gave in. And that's the first step of, of AA is admitting that you're powerless. So I basically told him, hey, I, yeah, I'll go. So he took me right to the liquor store. I drank in his car the whole way there. I was lit up, uh, so drunk, got on a plane, uh, and he sat next to me. This is like like a 20 minutes after I said I would go. We were literally in the car and on a fucking airplane. They were not going to accept me changing my mind. And I remember I was there was a, a woman sitting next to me, and I was kind of like, hey, you know, and he and he'd be like, Eric, I don't think it's a good idea, you know. Uh, and he was just sort of wrangling me, <clears throat> wrangling me, you know, trying to keep me contained till I got to this place. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I drank on the way to this detox center because when you're to that point, you have to medically get a detox. You can't just stop because, like we said earlier, you'll die. When I got there, I think my blood alcohol level was 0.3 something. Um, and I think 0.4 is death. So that gives you a little idea where I was at. Uh, and the lady was mystified. And it's not like you're getting dragged in no, there. No. Like, like you're walking, right? No, nah, man. I was telling jokes. I was just like, where's the studio at? You know? And yeah, no, I didn't even know. I was, you know, there were these nice, pretty nurses, and I was just telling them jokes and like, hey. And uh, they gave me a, an IV and started pumping all this, uh, uh, you know, to hydrate me. And because I wasn't when you're an alcoholic, you barely pee. So there had been months and months that I had actually taken like a normal piss. Uh, so they just hydrated the shit out of me. And I must have slept for four or five days. They give you some Valium. They give you medicine called Librium. They give you stuff that, uh, you know, will help your body sort of recover without going into a seizure because that's the default at that point. Once you've reached that point, um, your body just <laughs> You know, doesn't know what to do. So I finally got on my feet, you know, four or five days later, realized where the hell I was. And then they took me over to this right across the street to this big building. And I started my 90 day 
inpatient rehab thing. And that's kind of most of the journey that got me to where I'm at right now. And then how do you go from that in just 90 days to back out and living out like in the, in the, in the real world? Well, I didn't walk out of there. Um, I went to a, a sober living program. I did that for another 90 days. Um, so they basically step you down into life. Um, but they shut you off from the world. I didn't have to worry about any pressures. I didn't call any of my friends. Um, I didn't have to worry about bills. Not that I ever did, but I didn't have to worry about anything. It was just concentrating on my, myself and my sobriety and why you drink, because most people drink for a reason, you know, you have to look at the why is it look at me? Why is there insecurities? You know, maybe there's some abuse or something that you're trying to cover up or whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's that's what the point of rehab is to sort of figure out why you're drinking. Because it's not the um, problem; it's the solution to the problem. That's right, and 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 it's just you're just sort of self medicating something that's deeper inside you. So when I walked out, I had a better sense of who I was. I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew what I shouldn't do. I knew what would kill me. And I had another chance because I was so deep in the hole. They basically got me out of the hole to where I could function as a normal human being. Um, so you just, do you just feel like incredible after like this 180 days of like clean living and no alcohol in your system and, and kind of all refreshed and yeah, I was ready to take out the world, man. I, I hit the gym every day. Um, you know, I took it seriously. I, I just, I did everything, everything they told me. If you're out there and you got a problem, you go to rehab or you go to AA and you talk to someone who's been through what you're going through, listen to them, do everything they say, do everything they tell you because they've been there and you're not as smart as you think you are. Um, so I just listened to them. I just did what I was supposed to do and it, it worked for me for a while. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I haven't had fallbacks. Um, I've had long stretches of sobriety and then I've relapsed and then I've had sobriety and then relapse. And that's part of getting sober. It's a process, but it's something that you have to work on all of the time. It's a disease and it's never going away and it's progressive and it's always going to be there. It's always going to talk to you. Um, I don't know if you've seen a beautiful mind, uh, where he has, he sees these, uh, visions that aren't there. Essentially, I have someone in my ear all the time that's telling me, dude, what a shitty day. A, a beer would help. Or it's Friday. A beer, you know, it's no big deal. Or we're in Hawaii or whatever it is. It's always going to tell me it's OK. It's OK. It's there. It's waiting. It's waiting. And you have to actively work on on stopping it and using skills that you've learned to quiet it down. Because once you get the disease of alcoholism, you got it and that's it. Live with it. So what are some things that you're doing now? Like what does your – what's your daily routine look like? What are things that you do to ensure that you don't kind of slide back down that hill? Well, I do positive self-talk, which is you know you, you have to look at the good side of things. Uh, I do what's called a 10 step every night. Think about what I could have done better, how the day went. Um, I always have to remind myself that I am powerless because you could find yourself start. I mean, relapse is a process and it starts with a thought and then it starts with a small action and then another action and another action before you know it, you're drunk. And if anybody out there who is an alcoholic thinks that they can have one drink and be fine, you're a fool. And you're going to learn the hard way that you cannot do it. I mean, read, read Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not possible. Read a medical journal. It's not possible. You've got the disease. It's there. You've passed the point where you can be a normal human being, and you've got to deal with that. So how do you look at your day and look at where you could have done better but not come down on yourself too hard and then get depressed? Well, I get down on myself all the time. Um, but, you know, exercise is important. Having supportive people in your life who understand uh, 
what what situation you're in because a lot of people don't get it you know they'll just well just don't yeah just don't drink i mean i don't understand you why are you being such an asshole just stop drinking well it's not that easy i don't go to aa as much as i should and people should go every day but it's part of my life and i do affirmations uh, with my girlfriend Holly in the morning, basically some positive readings. You know, what can I do? What action can I take today to better my life? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Keep yourself in positive mindset because you get into what they call stinking thinking and you'll find yourself in a bar. So not to get like too personal, but you, you mentioned using uh, positive self-talk, which is something that I use and I think it is extremely effective. So just for some people out there that maybe are just getting started on this, what are some things that you tell yourself? Like, how do you how do you positively talk to yourself? Well, that I have things that are more important than myself to live for because inherently being an addict and an alcoholic, I'm a selfish person. So, you know, I have to remind myself of the great things that I have in my life that are bigger and better than me that that depend on me, like my children. Um, and my parents, of course, are getting older. They, they're going to, they depend on me more now. Um, my, my girlfriend, you know, we're in a relationship. I, I can't be absent for that emotionally. Um, but so I just, and telling yourself that you're a good person and that you mean well and actively trying to do good things. I mean, it sounds so stupid and it is a cliche, you know, help a lady across the street, open the door for somebody, something in that way that you can feel good about yourself. Um, because alcoholism is filled with such negative downers that you want to talk yourself up and it's an, it's a fairly easy tool and you're right. It sounds hippie and it probably is hippie, but hippies are very happy people. So like what is some advice, like if somebody's really having problems with a loved one, um, friend, family, whatever, what advice would you give them to deal with the alcoholics in their life from an alcoholic's perspective? I would say have the conversation. Um, I, I, I think it's important and mostly for people in like a, like a, you know, a sexual relationship, whatever, um, that if the person is completely shit faced and made some horrible mistakes and done something terrible, which is happening, I guarantee you that it's not good to call a drunk a drunk when they're drunk. Uh, you're not going to get very far with that. Uh, in, in the morning when there's some sobriety, but always let alcoholics, they need to know that you care. And, those things, as we have went through this timeline, there are those little moments that did stick in my head that ultimately did get me to say, I got a problem. So it's like planting seeds. Right. And ultimately, that plant will grow. So it's important to, to let those people know. And, and, and if you're a parent, certainly with kids, it's a lot easier to see changes in their behavior. Let them know that you see it. Um, and I, I, if, if you're having health problems or it's affecting your life in a terrible way and you have uh, the money to go to a rehab center, it, it's worth it. It will change your life. There are people out there who have dedicated their lives and don't make much money doing it to save you. And this is one of those things. I sat in a room with probably 13, 14 people and – I had a guy look at us and say, five of you are going to die. And you, and you think like, right. Yeah. Right. You, you know, fuck you. But literally I've lost three or four people that I knew and went into that center with, uh, you know, we weren't great friends, but we went through this experience together and they, they're dead. I mean, it's real. So, I mean, it's, it's a real thing and you don't realize it. You just hear about on the news, somebody OD'd, somebody this and that. But it's it happens. People do die. And you and you need to let your loved one know that you see what's going on and that there is help out there. And if you don't have the money, go to AA. There's always someone there to help you. That's all they want to do is help you. And you realize that the AA community is worldwide. You could be in fucking Mumbai 
and find an AA meeting. I mean, that's no bullshit. So something that I really want to make sure that people hear is to handle these people with addiction problems in the morning when they're sober and with love, never coming from anger. Right. Anger is just fuel for a drunk. She's mad at me. Look, look, look. Okay, so realest question I may have ever asked you, and we've known each other for a really long time. If your parents did not drag you to rehab, would you be dead? This this podcast is about not being a dumbass and not helping people or, or helping yourself and things like that, uh, helping them. Um, yeah, I needed help and I was smart enough in some way to get it. And if I didn't, with 100% certainty, I would not be here talking to you. I would have dragged myself to death. And I probably it would probably would have been something horrible. I would have passed out and hit my head and bled to death. And they found me two and a half weeks later. You know, can you imagine the, the impact on my parents and my friends and things like that? Like, that's just, I was on a downhill spiral and I needed to be stopped. I needed help. I need, and love, that, that, that's the key. More hippie stuff. Love. Come from it with love. And what, what's some other advice that you can give um, the loved ones of the people dealing with alcoholism just to give them, um, I don't know, a heads up or some, some kind of an idea of, of things that they can do in order to help the person that, that they love and care about? Bad luck for whoever's listening to this who has a loved one who is alcoholic. You've got a job now, too. You've been you've been lumped in. You didn't have a choice, but now you have a job. I mean, there's there's a program called Al-Anon specifically for people who have loved ones who are alcoholics. You have to learn how to live with an alcoholic, how to turn down an alcoholic, how to say no to an alcoholic, how to support an alcoholic. And it's not your choice, but you love that person. And now you have a job. And I think one thing that is this really important for people to listen to, especially like, you know, the loved ones and the friends and stuff is don't let the addiction and the sickness blind you to who the person really is. They're in there someplace. You know, they may be under a bunch of alcohol. They may be under a bunch of cocaine or heroin or whatever it is, but they're there. They're in there. And chances are they may not be able to make it back to who they should be without you and without your love and support. Right. And you have to always keep in mind if you're dealing with a loved one who's treating you terribly, who's cheating on you, who's lying to you, who's stealing from you. That's not that person. That's it's some something has taken over that person and you have to fight to get that person back because that person is not going to fight to get themselves back. But to the people who do get help and do get sober, then it's on you. You have to fight for yourself. It, and like I said, it's a, it's a bummer, but it's a job for the whole family. But it's worth it because you will get your loved one back, but you got to do the work. So are you cool with people contacting you, asking questions, either addicts or loved ones of addicts? I mean, I'd be happy to have people tweet me, um, at Mail Eric. Um, you know, if you guys want to talk or if I can... Uh, I, I know a lot of good rehabs, uh, specifically in the Utah area, but also in California. And I can definitely get you into contact with anybody if you need help or shit. If you just need someone to talk to or say, you know, admitting it helps, you know, tweet me. Hey, I got a problem. That's a great step. Good. Good for you. You know? All right, cool. So I'm going to have your contact in the show notes. I'm going to have links to... Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to have a link to the Cirque Lodge. Um, so, man, thank you so much for doing this. I know it's kind of hard talking about it, but it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you. And, hey, I appreciate it. I hope uh, everybody out there stays happy and healthy. Stay sober. All right, you guys. Pretty heavy episode. I hope you found some stuff that was uh, that was helpful. Again, his contact's going to be in the show notes. Um, you can check out you can check out the band we used to be in together, Starving Millionaires. I'll have that link down there. It's a reggae rock, a little kind of sublime thing, a little more punk rock. 
Um, again, the, the videos at the beginning and the end of this, if you were watching on YouTube, are videos of, of us when in our, in our younger days. Yeah, I hope you found some stuff useful. I don't know how you couldn't have. Um, I think Eric did a great job. And please reach out if there's anything. Reach out to him. Reach out to me if you're dealing with other stuff. There are people out there that have gone through stuff that you're going through right now. And there's people out there that are willing to help you deal with that. But you just got to put your hand out. And I hope you do. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you.